thank you all very much for inviting me back. I'm running out of things to say. <laughs> you guys are great. I hope I'm as good as the dessert. <laughs> I want to talk tonight about science and how science uh, in interfaces with faith. I am a card-carrying, hardcore scientist, so that's the perspective I'm coming from. And in particular, I'm a physicist, so what I have to say may not pertain to all branches of science. Okay. So let me tell you why I believe that science and faith are compatible. Now, certainly, in any group of people, there are the problem children. And there are people who seem to uh, make a crusade of increasing division and who probably pro profit from a certain amount of controversy. But among people of good faith, that is the rest of us, among people of good faith, I believe that science and faith are both compatible because they are both sincere efforts to seek truth. And after all, that's something that I think all of us value. Now, Pope John Paul II and St. Augustine addressed this issue. Uh, John Paul said that truth cannot contradict truth. And what he had in mind uh, was that the truth of science and the truth of faith must be the same because there is only one truth. And if it seems that they're incompatible, that's because we haven't understood them as well as we should. And what St. Augustine said is that God is both the author of the book of nature and the book of scripture. So while the details of the two books might seem a little bit different, the message should be the same because it's the same author in both cases. Now, many, many scientists, including the most two famous physicists of all time, Newton and Einstein, certainly believed in God. They didn't see any conflict between God and science. And according to a poll reported in the LA Times a couple years ago, 51% of scientists, if asked privately, will report that they do believe in God in one form or another. If you ask them to stand up at a meeting of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, I think you'll find a much smaller percentage. <laughs> but asked in private, this is what they express. And to quote the, my favorite scientist of all time, Einstein said these three things that I think are very telling. He said, there are only two ways to live your life. One is as if nothing is a miracle, and the other is as if everything is a miracle, and he was certainly in the second camp. He also said that all religions, arts, and sciences are branches of the same tree, and by that I think he meant they're all the pursuit of truth in one way or another. And finally, he said that uh, science without religion is lame, and religion without science is blind. He said a great many things in his life, not all of them are consistent, but I think these were the most telling. And what I think, as we said before, is that both science and faith are sincere efforts to seek truth, and I make a comparison with binocular vision. All of us see better because we have two eyes that view the world from slightly different perspectives. And so if we're intelligent, we can take the strengths of science and the strengths of faith and combine them and do a better job of finding the truth. None of us gets to decide what the truth is. All that we can hope to do is search for it. So, thank you very much. I think you have preference here. <laughs> uh, you know, the last of your outline was uh, just a comment on Dr. Hawking's uh, most recent book. Yes. Oh, should I say something about that? Okay. Well, let me just say in a couple of words why I think that his book is not a contribution. Uh, first of all, there's absolutely no new science in Hawking's book. All of those ideas have been around for probably 40 years. Uh, secondly, he says that God is unnecessary because uh, there are an infinite number of universes, and they all have different laws of physics, and so however improbable life is in our universe, it had to happen somewhere. And that's not mathematically sound reasoning, it turns out. There are plenty of infinite sets of things that don't have all the combinations in them. A simple example is the prime integers. There are an infinite number of prime integers, only one of which is divisible by two. There are an infinite number of even numbers that are not in the infinite set of prime integers. 
So the assumption that an infinite set of universes would include all combinations is mathematically wrong. But if you did take uh, his assumptions to be correct, then his conclusion about God is exactly wrong. Because if there are an infinite number of universes and every conceivable possibility exists in at least one, then God must exist in at least one. Because God is certainly a conceivable possibility. So to say that he has proven that God is unnecessary, I think is, he got the logic wrong. So I think the problem I, that I have with him is not that he has ideas I disagree with. The problem is that these ideas get presented to the public as if they're scientific facts. And they're not. They're just personal opinions. And of course he's welcome to his personal opinions, but they ought to be more clearly labeled as his personal opinions and not the position of science. So I think he's doing a disservice to science and a disservice to society. And uh, you know, so that's why I speak up against it. Yes, sir? I had a somewhat related question. That is about your thoughts on the probability of life occurring spontaneously as opposed to what some other authors have I've seen statistical analysis things with doctors or some other biologists that, that talked about that and came to different conclusions. And I was wondering what what the difference in the assumptions are or whatever that, that led you in different directions. Okay, I have this book in which I analyze the probability that life could begin by accident. Are you referring to my book? Yeah. Okay. And that book makes the most modest possible assumptions. I, I'm only assuming that uh, life has to be made of atoms, and I'm, I know how many atoms there are in the universe, and I assume from the work of J. Craig Venter what is the smallest amount of DNA that any living thing can have. And he's the world's expert in the field, and he's done a major research project to uh, evaluate that, so I take his, his number at face value. And uh, you can simply do the calculation. I mean, it's not a very difficult calculation. Okay, and you're, so, you're assuming the end pro probability of getting to the end product. Do you allow any self-assembly? Yeah, but you know, so that actually makes it worse. Does it? Okay. It makes it worse because, oh, Okay, so J. Craig Venner says you need uh, 460,000, 462,000 nucleotide base pairs to make the DNA of the smallest creature that could be self-sustaining and self-reproducing. Okay, so let's say that you try to do that in steps. What happens when you get to 200 nucleotides, a sequence of 200 nucleotide base pairs? How is that going to be identified as the successful sequence that's ultimately going to get you to life. It's not self-reproducing or self-sustaining because you need 462,000 to get to self-reproducing and self-sustaining. If you make one copy of every version that had 200 nucleotide base pairs in the world, you would consume every atom in the universe. So there wouldn't be any more atoms to react to make more. So you've got to get rid of the bad combinations immediately. Well, how do you know what the bad combinations are if, you know, the first life is 2,000 times more complicated than that? Okay. <laughs> Sir, I just want to express uh, my admiration for your work. I have, we have chatted. I have read your books. Now I can buy the third one. Uh, as, as you mentioned, I'm a rabbi, I was a physicist before becoming a rabbi, and your work has been tremendously helpful to me in expressing my belief, which like yours, is that the faith and science are compatible. I love your, the slide that was up before about the binocular vision, yeah. and you know, it, it not only gives you more information, but it literally gives you a depth that yes. is impossible with monocular vision. I think it's a wonderful image. Uh, there are other you know, information in your books, particularly, for me at least, the whole idea of the Goldilocks zone, which you may just want to mention. I don't know if you, if you have time to go into detail about it. But for me, that's 
you know, that that's the face of God. Uh, so to call the locked zone of the galaxy. Well, or yeah, the how, how particular our our range of our family of galaxies are the yeah. Milky Way is our place in the Milky Way. Yeah. Uh, all of these things. It's a yeah. In the book, I list uh, thirteen things about the Earth, which include the properties of our galaxy, that I think are remarkably special. I don't think the Earth is unique in the entire universe, but I think that probably you have, to, you have to go through a billion planets before you find something as good as the Earth. The Earth is not just the best of eight planets in the solar system. The Earth is really fabulously special. And the curvature of the universe that allows life to exist is drastically more special than that. Even. So the, the number, you, you you seem to like a number, right? Yeah, you, got it. you were asking me the probability of accident. The probability that even the simplest bacteria could form by accident anywhere in the entire universe at any time since the beginning of creation, it's one in a number, in a big number, and that big number has 230,000 digits. <laughs> and I don't know how to describe that number any other way. <laughs> there ain't no English word for that. <laughs> <laughs> What's the name for that number? <laughs> Big. It's a picture. 